This is Duke University. Because we're talking about this question of voice and sort of like how does it, I'm going to read this other story. I wasn't planning on reading this one, but um, I'm reading this. I'm reading this for Roxana um, and anybody else who's been to Hialeah. So this story is called Happy Birthday, Dear Dante. It was the worst. Rolly's mom was all like, no, you are not coming into this house. And in my head, I was like, really? It's your grandson's birthday or whatever? And it's going to be like that? Really? Whatever, I said. Where's Rolly? Mind you, I'm still standing outside the fence. This woman, she would not even open the gate for me. Tell me what that tells you about her, okay? Because you know she knows me. She's known me since I, like, I was 14, right? Like for four years. So I don't even get it, but okay, fine. I'm just standing on the street in the middle of Hialeah with her son's kid on my hip and sweating like crazy, but no biggie, right? Okay, so I see how it is. She says, Rolando's not here. <laughs> and then she like squashed her lips like she was super not impressed with me showing up at her house again. Crossed her arms like this at me over her chest. I was like, bullshit. So I say to her, I seen him right there. Right where, she says to me. And so I move Dante to my other hip and I point at the window, which I know is their kitchen. There, I say to her. I even go, in the kitchen. So she could remember how I used to be over there like every day for all those years. And right then the curtain moves and I'm like, see? And Dante starts clapping like we practice for after the happy birthday song. So I have to be all like, oh my God, not yet. <laughs> then she goes, I'm going to call the police. But she says this like every time, so I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I yell to the window, Rolly, get your ass out here and call your mom off of me already. This is getting tired. And then she's like, I told you he's not here. But I catch her looking back at the door and shaking her hand near her hip. So I'm like, what is that? What are you doing? Rolando, she yells. And then there he is. I haven't seen his face in like four weeks, in like a month. <laughs> So I bend down on my side of their fence so I can grab like a bunch of rocks. <laughs> Rolly goes, don't you fucking throw rocks at me, lady. You're a fucking grown ass woman for once. I know, right? So I throw like a bunch of those little white rocks at his car in the driveway. <laughs> he was all like, lady, lady, oh my God, what the fuck, or whatever. <laughs> the rocks, it sounded worse than it was. They weren't big rocks. They were like those clean rocks you buy at the store for your yard or whatever. His mom had put them around her pepper plants to keep the weeds off them. They're not even rocks. They're like nothing. <laughs> so once the rocks go all like da, 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 off the side of his Integra and fall to the ground, I go to him, don't talk to me about being a grown ass adult, OK? Because you're the one living with his mom, OK? Who won't even come see his own kid on his own birthday. He goes, his birthday isn't until Saturday. Then he goes, the party's on Saturday. I wish he was like closer to the fence right then so that I could smack him in the head. Because yeah, the party's Saturday or whatever. But he knew Dante's actual birthday was actually that day that I was there, that Thursday. <laughs> but you're not going to have a kid's party on a Thursday, right? Who does that, right? Exactly, that's all I'm saying. Then from his mom, she goes, you need to stop making excuses to come here. We don't want you here. I feel like going too freaking bad because here I am, right? <laughs> like, what are you going to do about it? Because I'm not going away, and Dante is not going away either. He like just got here. I mean, sometimes when he's super annoying, it's like he's been around like 10 years or something, but he's only like one. <laughs> he was like only one that day. <laughs> Which means me and Roly have been having this kind of fight for more than a year. It really is getting super tired. So I hide Dante up because he's getting heavy and I go to Roly's mom, listen, this is between me and the father of my son. So unless you have a birthday present for your grandson, I suggest you go back inside your house now. No, wait. I know what you're going to say. Oh my god, lady, how could you say that to her? That's super disrespectful. <laughs> but really, she's been disrespecting me so much since way back when Rolly told her I was pregnant and the first thing she says is like, are you 100% sure that baby is yours? And honestly, I think that's what made him super paranoid about getting married or whatever and why he wouldn't do it finally. Because of her, I'm pretty sure. And like, at some point, Dante, he's going to understand. He's gonna like know that his abuela from that side hates my guts for like no reason. Because I keep saying this to her, that you can't like make a kid by yourself. 
So it's not like 100% my fault, even if I sort of knew I was doing it on purpose. I know, okay, that I was supposedly taking the pill like every day, that I should have told Roly I'd stopped after graduation. But really, I was like super happy about a baby, okay? What do you want me to tell you? I thought Roly would be too, but he was all, oh my God, no, this is the worst thing ever, whatever. But like, too bad. It's been a year. More than that, if you count me being pregnant, so everybody needs to get used to it already. But yeah, no, when I said that, she got seriously pissed off and starts yelling at Roly like, how dare she say that to me? How dare she speak to me like that? Rolando, get these pieces of trash out of my yard before I call someone to take them away from you, for you. I can think of a million things to say right now, but at that moment, nothing. I was just like this, with my mouth open like this. <laughs> like, are you serious? <laughs> like, think what you want about me, fine. But really, Dante really is your grandson. I mean, that was the whole point. Plus, look at you, then look at him, and tell me this isn't your hair and your color. No, look at your hands, and Rolly's hands, then at Dante's hands. Look at the white little hills at the base of each nail. Look how thick the fingers are. And then tell me they're not the same freaking fingers. So I look at Rolly then, because for real, this is when he needs to put his mom in her place and be a man and be like, go in the house, mommy. Because for so long before, I was thinking that all it would take for him to be a man would be for him to see the baby once I had it, and then that would be it. Then we get back together and get married or whatever. I know better now, right? Of course, because that would have happened already if it was going to happen, and I get that he hates my guts or whatever. But at least defend the mother of your kid, right? At least do that for me. But no, he doesn't. He goes to me, lady, you really got to go. Look, I'll see you guys Saturday. Seriously, it isn't really isn't fucking fair sometimes. And all I wanted was for Roly to feel that for like a second. So I go to Dante. Papi wants to say happy birthday. Time to do the happy birthday song. Yay, do it, go, do it. So I started to sing it. And Dante sometimes I think is a super genius because he starts singing and clapping better than when we practice. And he doesn't stop when I lift him up over my head and over their fence. And when I like <laughs> lower him down to the other side, I don't stop singing even though the top of the chain link is digging into my stomach like a bunch of broken knives. Oh my god, I wasn't just going to drop him. I knew I had to do it slow. And I knew I couldn't just leave him there till Saturday. I knew that. But I kept going like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and clapping with the song and with Dante while I pretended to back away. And Dante, he doesn't even look at me or cry or nothing. And he doesn't run straight to Roly either, or even Roly's mom, though why would he? He just did this drunk baby walk over to more of those same fake rocks, but on their side of the fence, like lining the driveway. He drops down to them when his knees wobble, and he sits in them like he's a tree or something. But he keeps clapping and singing even when I stopped, even over everybody screaming at me when I pretended to get in my car. Dante kept doing like we practiced. It's like I could still hear him singing after I pretended to shut the door, even after I pretended to put the car in reverse. He was probably still singing even when I saw in the rearview mirror that like not one of those people had picked him up out of those rocks yet. I think it comes from a real sense of, of longing for it, you know, of, of missing it and missing that, not just that space, but that time and sort of like my imagination hangs out there. And so that's where the stories sort of come from. So, and also wanting to sort of like pay tribute to that. I feel like the Miami that I saw in literature, when I saw it was not what I had grown up with or seen. What I tried to do with a lot of the different plot elements in the book is like, there is a, like, that's the thing, there is a reality that is like almost that telenovela, like over the topness to Miami that it doesn't, it's not aware of, right? And, and so that those kinds of things are often like weirdly common or mm -hmm. just like they, they happen down there and I think they happen everywhere but in Miami it's sort of like just accepted that that's it and that's what I was trying to do like show how you know these really not like to not exoticize it or fetishize it and show how sort of like mundane that is in some ways mm -hmm. like oh this like th that kind of event isn't the kind of thing that defines a family for instance whereas I feel like mm -hmm. in, if that were to happen in like the Midwest it would be like the thing the family never talked about right it would be a very different sort of way of thinking about an event as central to a family narrative, whereas in, I, I feel like there's something about Latino culture or maybe even just Miami as a space that, just that loudness of everything. Like if everything's so loud, nothing, you can't hear anything, <laughs> is sort of how it feels. So that's I think what I was trying to convey a little bit with some of the stories.
I wonder if you would like to talk a little bit about creative writing from somebody who is in between. My interests are more in that sort of first generation, 1.5 generation, I'm sure you guys know all about that stuff. Um, and sort of how, how are we bringing that sort of heritage into what it means to be American? Um, and how is that sort of informing, uh, informing us as Americans a little bit? Um, so yeah, it's, it's not that I don't care about Cuba, it's that I think there are writers for whom that is a huge question, and it's just not for me because it's always existed as a story. It's always been stories told to me, and I just can either can repeat a story, but I'm more interested in sort of making a new one. It's yeah. for me, um, it very much connected to voice and the mm -hmm. idea of listening carefully to the cadence of people's speech, sort of like how, um, like I want to be respectful of that. I think there's a certain kind of like, um, like code switching or mixing up that happens a lot that it isn't that I don't want to draw attention to, but that people who sort of do it will feel they'll like see themselves in it. I don't want to italicize the Spanish, um, which is also a choice that I make there because I feel like for most for almost all these characters, the Spanish is their English, right? Mm. And um, this word wouldn't be like right after that. It's like ese come mierda, right? And that's not italicized because that's mm -hmm. infusing. I don't think of it as Spanglish. I think of it as their English, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. a very Miami English. That, I mean, anywhere you go, you probably saw this on your trip. You, like, there are whole McDonald's on the Sahuacera that don't have English menus. Um, and that if you don't speak Spanish, you're not going to be able to order there. Um, and I know that that's, you know, that's a, a different kind of, in the political arena, that's, we can talk about what that means. But I, when you grow up with that and you, you can have both languages, I don't know that you make the distinction between them in your brain. And so I don't make a distinction visually with the italics, and I don't make a distinction when I'm listening of like how a character would say um, would say something and it's not necessarily even when they would use Spanish or English it's when they would um, like the inflection or the way they sort of talk mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a very much a Miami sound I think it's, it's not, I just want them to be, I really just want them to be better readers by the time okay. they leave, more okay. careful readers, and to actually, okay. appre like when someone says something, like let's talk so about sentences. Yeah, reading. or just to pay very close attention to like, the idea that everything you're feeling is a sort of manipulation, right? I mean, that's the ugly word for it, but that, and that all that is through a series of syntactical moves on the page, right? Mm -hmm. Someone puts a period somewhere and it makes you feel something different than if it had been a comma and moves into the next clause. And I just want them paying that kind of careful attention so that they can be wowed by small things. Writing and, and reading, but mostly writing, yeah, like writing, creating reading, these, it, writing. what you're doing is you're creating, um, I've, I've said this before, but you're creating a sensory experience that allows someone to feel compassion for someone different from them. And if you have, if you're, if you're doing that over and over again in the act of creation, you're going to extend that out into how you treat other people. At least that's the hope.